Really excited to talk about this topic this week because for one of the first times on, on Loop Live, um, having now run over a couple of years, is that we're going to shift our focus from just talking about uh, the work that we do to actually talking about the workers that do the work um, and the types of people um, and the types of environments that we need to set up as, as businesses um, and the types of change that we, we're going to make. Um, so today joining me, we don't have a presentation, but I'm going to have a chat with the authors of a book that has been keeping um, me busy lately, um, and that's a book called Belonging. Um, it's written by the authors that I'm going to introduce to you um, in a moment, um, and it's definitely been keeping me busy. I'm one of those people um, that highlights all of the pages um, in the book as I go through. Um, so I'm really excited about, about talking to these people today um, about how we can change our workforce. So I'm going to introduce um, a couple of people um, to join me now. Um, if along the way um, you do have questions or comments, um, please leave them in the comments box um, and we can see if we get time. But I've actually got a whole heap of questions for these people. So I'm going to introduce three people. Sue Uneman, um, Catherine Jacobs, uh, Catherine Jacob, and Mark Edwards uh, as well um, to join us. So, uh, and they're joining us again all the way from the UK. So it's a, a little bit later in the morning than, than Chris and Mariam joined us last week, um, but it's definitely early in the morning. So thank you guys for joining us. Hi. Hi. Good to be here. Thank you for having us. Okay, so let's let's get straight into it. As I mentioned, um, the the book is is belonging. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to, to Sue to not talk about the book, but maybe um, give us an understanding of what is belonging to you, uh, and and give your your personal opinion on that. Great, thanks, Josh. So I'm uh, Sue Uniman. I'm Chief Transformation Officer of MediaCom in the UK, and I've actually worked for the business for uh, more than thirty years. So you could say that I feel like I belong in this organization. And of course, it's changed so much over that time. Media's changed so much over that time. And if there's one thing that I know, though, about why Mediacom has um, uh, been a great place for me to work, why I've got so many colleagues that have worked with me for more than 10, more than 15, more than 20 years, it's because it has a great culture of belonging. and without that sense that whoever you are, you can challenge anybody else in the building, without the sense that you feel safe to bring your whole self to work, it's really difficult to basically be your best self at work. And as you pointed out so well, Josh, to bring that diversity of opinion and get to a place where everybody can contribute and you're actually building and creating new ideas. So when I first joined the company, it was it was a very small one. Um, and it was, it was probably a, a, just a bunch of people who weren't particularly typical media people. And working together and working out how to get the best out of each other has, I hope, created a culture that stands true. Well, I, I really hope stands true for Mediacom around the world. And I now belong to the Mediacom Global Belonging Council, where what we're trying to do is make sure that we get the best mix out of the best talent. I think one of the great things that's happened during this um, lockdown is that we're all using screens much more. And whilst that's got downsides in many ways, what it does mean is that I'm able to join a call with you on the other side of the world a lot more easily than I would if I had to jump on an aeroplane. So, you know, belongings, it's a, it's a, it's a big word if you like, but for me, it's about being able to bring your whole self to work and, really complement and contribute to the skills of the team and the, and the and the different people that are in the team with you. Yeah, I, thought, I think that's really interesting. I thought the, the most interesting thing that, that I read in the book or that I've read in the, the book so far was that perspective around diversity and inclusion programs um, being inclusive. So it's not just about singling out a, um, a certain area, but, but as, you, as you put at the start, it's about everyone being involved in it and it's about um bring being able to be confident to bring yourself in into that organization for not the fear of being singled out by anyone else or or, or those kinds of things yeah i mean I, you know th there's over six um billion pounds spent a year on diversity and inclusion programs worldwide you know, i'm a media planner by heritage i like a bit of return on investment i like to understand <laughs> what the outcomes are and the outcomes of that spending, which has been going on for a few years now, 
don't actually see there's been plenty of outputs there's been plenty of away days and and training courses but the change at the top of organizations and the top of businesses hasn't actually changed very much um and so if i if i think about the there's a new survey that's just out the economist um, do a survey looking at, at gender diversity japan and south korea uh, at number 28 29 in the table the uk is at number 20 in the table things just haven't moved on there's been a lot of activity and noise now we set out to investigate this when we wrote the book together and one of our key thoughts is that the current inclusion program seems to exclude the very people who are currently in charge who very often feel as though they're having a finger pointed at them for making yet another mistake we've got to be more inclusive and we've got to look out for each other and if you do that if you can create a culture that does that then you attract great people and you keep great people Great. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that you spoke about, things kind of haven't changed in Mediacom over that time. One of the things that has changed in business, as you point out, is the investment in it, but we're not seeing the return on investment. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get Catherine to expand on that a little bit. Um, there's been so much money being spent and so much time being invested in inclusion and diversity initiatives. Um, but we do still have workplaces that are full of inequity, um, unfairness, prejudice, um, but also discrimination. Why do you think that that is, is still occurring despite all of these programs that are, that are happening? Morning um, from London. Uh, I think it's because there's a plausible deniability, actually. You know, you, you go to the program, you spend two days talking about how you're going to run an inclusive team everyone thinks the job's done and then you just go back to your day job and just carry on recruiting the way that you have because no one's in in so many businesses it's not a business target so when we did research for the book um people 52 percent of people said they they thought that the the senior management was was um personally invested in driving diversity 52 percent and if you think you turned around and said well what about profit or what about growth Everyone will go, yeah, 100%. They're 100% focused on that. And it's because it feels a bit like a tick box exercise, I think. And people go, yeah, 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 we've done a program. That's fixed it. Or we've got a really great new head of talent and the pipeline's going to be fixed and, uh, and that's going to be great. Well, <clears throat> almost certainly fixing the pipeline doesn't work because what you've got to do is recruit and then support and then retain and promote people throughout it's not enough to kind of point to your you know youth intake program and go well this will all fix itself because if that was the case in so many businesses there'd be far more um diverse management at the top of companies and if you look for example in the uk at something like the hampton alexander review 30 percent of women on boards you know great they've hit their target you know we've they've hit 36 percent it's because they're all non-exec directors they're not actually in the business business and there's lots of ways that people can look like they're doing the right thing. But actually, when you dig into it, you know, to Sue's point about return on investment, it's not happening. I think I think that area around plausible de deniability is is a really important is a really important point. Um, uh, one of the other things that that I really liked in in the book as as I was reading through it is about that. I suppose the the philosophy of knowing yourself. Like if you know yourself, you'll be you're able to kind of check yourself when when some of those things come up. That it isn't just I will tick it off and, and I will do it um, but if something occurs or if something that you feel is is a prejudice that you have that's coming up that you're able to check yourself um, so I'm going to ask Mark that question I'm going to kind of transfer over because I think um, it, uh, emotional intelligence is a, is a really important part of that um, and it's not something that comes natural to, to everyone and, and perhaps leaders in organizations so what, what do you think Mark you believe organizations can do to help improve employees emotional intelligence to be able to kind of combat some of that plausible deniability that that happens um, and make sure that it happens every day not just at the away day every year yes um i think that the 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 first thing organizations need to do is to understand that emotional intelligence is a thing and that it exists and that it needs to be developed uh you know uh we work in media we like stats and figures um research shows that people with high levels of 
high, the high levels of emotional intelligence are seven times more strongly correlated to success at work than high IQ, academic qualifications, or even craft skills. So somebody with high EQ is going to be more successful and contribute more to the company than the person who's got all the digital training in the world and a degree from wherever and an MBA and et cetera, et cetera. So there's a value to organizations, first of all, in investing it. I think that is something that would be helpful for them to know that um, uh, because some people can think it's a little bit woo woo and we don't really want it. There won't be any return on investment here. The will. I think people have to understand that if if you have high emotional intelligence, it means you have a better relationship with your thoughts and a better relationship with your emotions. Um, we probably don't have um, a format here where I can ask everybody a question now. I don't know, but I'm going to hypothetically, rhetorically say to everyone on the call, have you ever been trained or educated on how to feel your feelings? And I know that 99% of people are going to be shaking their heads and going, no, I haven't. It's one of the weirdest gaps in our education systems around the world. And if you can manage your emotions and you can, that doesn't mean hide them. It doesn't mean anesthetize them. It just means manage them well, feel, feel okay with a, a range of feelings. Then you can do your work better. The people around you can do the work better. And uh, you also understand each other better. I think that uh, organizations need to understand the importance of empathy and sympathy. And we need to be clear about what they are, because there's a lot of talk about empathy. And most people don't really know what it is. And certainly it's not a natural human skill. We're not naturally good at it. We're good at sympathy, but we have to learn empathy. And the difference is, I'm going to borrow an analogy that Sue uses for sympathy. Sympathy is if you own a cat, a cat will occasionally bring you a dead bird as a present. Now that's sympathy without any empathy. Uh, the cat is doing something nice, but you don't perceive it as nice because you're different from the cat. So the sympathy, there is no empathy. Empathy without sympathy is Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs someone who completely understands what's going on in another person's mind but doesn't care and what we need is for people to understand you need a mix of the two and you need to work on empathy because the fact that we're not naturally very good at empathy is highlighted by the phrase the common phrase we would use to describe empathy is oh how would i feel if i was in their shoes that's not empathy Empathy is how do they feel in their shoes and can I get to that place? And that's take that's a difficult skill. So in the book, we, we put together some exercises to help teams have empathy with each other. And so it's about sitting, sitting down instead of trying to guess what other people feel like or how they're different from you, actually talking about it and asking about it. So just one example is there's a whole uh, list of questions that a team can discuss. And one of them is, what am I like on a bad day at work? And what kind of support do I want? Because everybody's different and everybody wants different kinds of support. Now, if you're guessing or basing it on what you would like, you're going to get it yeah. wrong just because you're a human being, not because there's anything wrong with you. If you ask somebody, how do you feel when you're having a bad day? What would be, do you want people to talk to you? Do you want to be left alone? Do you want, you know, then you know the answer and then you can actually be empathetic and you can actually support each other. Great, so I think that's 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 really big. Like I think that, that that's gonna be a big organizational change for a lot of places uh, and for a lot of people within those organizations. Um, I'll hand over to Sue because Sue's a, a leader within our organization. Um, and many many people believe that that change and, and diversity sits with leaders um, to be able to change that. So it's a bit of a two barreled question. Why do you think that? Uh, and what can we do as individuals to kind of address that balance uh, in our organization as well? Look, I, I want to say, first of all, I think Mediacom is a great place to work. And I, I, I haven't met a leader within Mediacom that doesn't 
really focus on the idea of diversity and inclusion. But as Mark said, it's tough. And we know that we're not perfect. We know that we're on a journey. It does have to come from the top, but it has to come not just from the top in a token way, but through the real belief of every single manager within the organization. So yes, your, your CEO in a market has got to believe in um, diversity and inclusion truly being important. But if you are a manager of a team, you need to believe it as well. We also think, and, and the research in our, our book shows, that everybody has to lead from every seat. So whilst it's true that not enough people in general at the moment, so this isn't a stat for Mediacom, this is a stat for business in general. In business in general, one in three people don't feel like they belong in the office. Now, we, we know that that's a better stat for Mediacom, um, but for any business out there, one in three, that means if you're in a meeting with two or three other people, one of them doesn't feel like they belong if you feel like you belong there. And actually, we think it's your very special job if you do feel like you belong to be inclusive and to make those other people feel like they belong. But the other thing is, is that just as it's not OK for somebody senior to make some kind of remark or some kind of comment or some gesture that doesn't include everybody in the team because he won't get or she won't get the best out of the whole team, it's also actually not okay for the rest of the team to never challenge the leader of that team or the, or the chair of that meeting if they make that kind of um, behavior over and over again. And we know this goes on as well because we know that um, uh, people do talk about this, this idea of microaggressions. So, you know, a very small gesture that can make somebody feel excluded when you might even have the intention, you might even been trying to be welcoming, but the, but the outcome, because of a lack of empathy, is that they feel excluded. But that even more people have witnessed this kind of behavior and haven't felt safe to challenge it. And this, I think, needs to change. And, and if we all said, right, from this moment on, so it's 8.19 in the UK, it's much later where you are, from now on, if I ever see or come across any of this kind of behavior, I pledge that I will find a way of challenging it. Then we immediately get a better working environment for everyone. And it's a better and it's a kinder one, but it's also one where diverse ideas can come together and you get better decisions that drive a competitive advantage. So it's win-win. It is definitely a win-win. I, I, I remember in the in the book hearing about the you know, diverse organisations being profitable, and that, and leaders like talking about profit profitability, if not if nothing else, with it within an organisation. Um, so I think that's a, a really interesting point. I'm going to go back to something that, that you mentioned at the start because I'm a media person. I picked up on a, on a stat that you mentioned about one third of people um, don't feel like that they belong. Um, so I'm going to hand over to, to Catherine because I think um, there was a, an, an analogy in the book around wearing a glass slipper um, where we pretend to be anything other than our true self. Um, and I think that that's what a lot of those, that one third probably feel like when they, they come into an organisation. Can you elaborate on, on that point a little bit more, Catherine? Because I think that, that was really interesting for me. Uh, yeah, this is the Cinderella glass slipper syndrome. So actually, if you go back to the, you know, the undisnified version of, of Cinderella, which is all very lovely in the end, um, what actually happens is when uh, Prince Charming goes to look for his true love that he lost at midnight, uh, who only left behind this glass slipper, he goes around trying the shoe on uh, with everybody. And uh, in the original uh, fairy tale, the, the sisters actually cut their toes off to fit into the glass slipper so that they're the perfect fit. And the only thing that gives them away that they're not the person who is the uh, original owner of the glass slipper is the fact that the slipper fills up with blood and that's what gives them away. And so often, you know, the glass slipper thing is where what we do is we shave off bits of ourselves or our personality or our natural behaviors to, to fit in to this kind of glass slipper thing. So what we do is we, you know, if you're if you're very extroverted and people go, oh, you're a bit loud, you kind of tone it down a bit, even though you're quite, you know, it might just be a sign of enthusiasm. It could be that if you're someone who's got a very, 
which we were talking about before we started this. You know, if you're someone who's got one of those faces that when you're concentrating, you look kind of quite fierce and you get pe people in meetings going, lighten up more, you know, why don't you smile more? So you spend the whole looking like sort of like Heath Ledger in The Joker rather than actually thinking, well, I've got to be smiling, God, I must be smiling. It's that kind of thing. Well, what we do is we think there's this fit that we have to be. Um, and it's not just people from the protected characteristics. You know, Mark's got this really great statistic, which I think is it's 45% of straight white men cover at work. So they pretend to be something that they're not. They kind of amp up bits of their personality, be it that we're a very robustuous kind of blokey organisation, or they, you know, or they fake an interest in football because otherwise you never fit in. This just think of all that effort that we're spending fitting into this glass slipper that we could be spending on doing really brilliant work rather than trying to pretend to fit in. And that's why culture fit is such a it's such a stupid phrase. Who decides what it is and what's the fit? You know. Why shouldn't it be a culture ad? Why aren't? Why don't we say, you know, we like who you are and we like what you do. And yeah, you're not like, you know, the the archetype that maybe we think that we have to have in organisations. You're different, but you'll you'll add to our culture and make us think differently. That's what we should be doing. Not going, yeah, are you a culture fit? Is one of our key questions because you're just asking people to be something that they're not. Yeah, that, I think that that the point around culture is really important. I, I, I touched on a little bit before, but I'm going to ask Mark to elaborate on that because I, I think you'll have a, a good answer for this. Um, because what, what does it do to actually create a culture um, within an organisation that everyone feels like they can speak their truth, that they can disagree, as as Sue mentioned, with um, with someone that's within a meeting? Um, how how do you actually create that culture change within an organisation? Yeah, I mean, that is a big culture change. Um, I think probably there are kind of three things that you need. Um, you need very clear signals from the top. Uh, you need the leaders and managers who know how to make decisions. And you need specific skills within each individual. Um, signals for the top in that, as with everything we talked about today, this is going to work best if the CEO takes personal responsibility for it and sets out how they want the culture to be, because then everybody in every meeting knows, does the organization back me in this behavior? No? I think managers and leaders need to know how to make decisions uh, because currently uh, I, I, my own personal experience of sitting in a lot of meetings over the years is that most organizations make decisions by a group of people sitting around the table and everybody expressing their opinion and the person with the loudest opinion or the person with the most seniority gets their way. Now, that's a terrible way to make decisions and it's the way most decisions are made. Uh, so, and when you make decisions like that, what happens is a, a significant number of people leave that meeting annoyed at the decision that's been made and completely uncommitted to making it, making it happen or making it succeed, you know? Uh, so what, what would be great is for organizations to train their managers and their leaders in a, a transparent and effective way to make decisions in which involves getting everybody heard. Uh, and that, you know, there are systems and processes out there. It's just that most organizations don't use them. And then I think, also, for, for each individual, uh, I think, needs to understand, and this goes back to the emotional intelligence, how to disagree without arguing, how to disagree without having a furious row. And there are strategies you can put in place to do that. And we, we've got several in the book. I mean, just one example is simply understanding that there are three kinds of disagreement. There's a disagreement because you have different facts and information than the other person. There's a disagreement because you have the same facts and information, but you're interpreting them differently. And there is a disagreement because you fundamentally disagree. And the first two are very easily resolvable without 
having to have a, an argument. The third one's more difficult. Um, you know, we've probably got time to go into how to do that now. But you can not, you, know, you can get rid of two thirds of disagreements very easily without a huge amount of conflict if you just understand what kind of disagreement you're having. So it's possible to challenge people on that basis without creating a lot of tension and conflict and anxiety in the room. So um, yeah, and I think the, the the big tool that we talk about in the the book that's massively important here is disagree and commit. Uh, which is probably a phrase a lot of people have heard of, which simply means that as the leader or the most important hierarchical person in the room, you say to everybody, we're doing this in two phases. We're having a disagree phase and we're having a commit phase. And my deal as the boss in this room is in phase one, I want you all to disagree with me. OK, it's fine. I'm not going to leave the room thinking, well, they were a problem. You know, I'm asking you to give me contradictory opinions because it will make, help us reach a better decision. Then phase two, in return for this open culture, phase two, when we finally make a decision, everybody gets behind it. You don't go, well, that wasn't my idea, so I don't want to do it, you know? And just separating these two things is incredibly helpful, but you have to really frame the meeting like that. You have to tell people, that's what you're doing and you have to mean it. Perfect. I think that's really good advice. I mean, I think it's, it's really practical advice as well. And that's that's one thing um, that I liked about the book. We're running out of time. I was, I was going to get um, Sue and, and Catherine to have a, a last word. But um, I think the one thing, I mean, there, there's a lot of words in the book coming from them. So I think that's the, the kind of best last, last word. The, the thing that I liked about the book um, the most is is how how structured it is, um, and may, maybe that's just me personally, but it is really practical. Um, it's not just a um, a, a five hundred page uh, book about about belonging. It's really how do I make change? How do I take action? And there's some really practical advice um, that gets in there. So um, I'm going to finish reading it. Um, for everyone that's that's um, on today, we're going to put a link for how to buy the book um, in there. I encourage everyone to do it because I think this is a really important part um, of modern business. Um, we are out of time. I'm going to thank all of you for, for coming. Um, I really liked it. Uh, <laughs> I love the conversation. Um, and I loved getting your, your guys' opinion coming out of the book uh, as well. So next week, we're back with The Loop Live. Um, we're going to switch from um, the people to, to back into the work. Uh, we're going to talk about e-commerce next week and, and getting growth out of e-commerce. Um, but I think, you know, talking about people in e-commerce is, is really important as well. It's one of the biggest shifts in the types of knowledge that we've had to change in, in people in, in the last, you know, 10 months, um, let, alone, let alone 10 years. Um, so we're going to shift back into the work next week, talk a little bit how to grow in e-commerce, um, but thank you all for joining. Um, join next week. Uh, we'll be back again, as usual, back at our normal time at 2.30 Singapore time. Um, so thank you, Sue, Catherine, and Mark for joining us today. Thanks. And thanks, thanks everyone for joining. Much. Thanks. Have, have a, have a great you. day. Bye. Bye.